Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures, I'm Big Lee and this week I want to talk about Command and Control. So this week's video is sort of a follow-up to what I discussed last week. So if you haven't seen it yet, I talked about the potential problems of multiplayer games where the control of an army is shared between two or more sub-commanders. And I asked the question, does this make this sort of game more difficult to execute, um, you know, to carry out and to plan? After all, individual commanders will inevitably react to the circumstances that they are facing in their portion of the command you know, um, on the battlefield and can therefore be distracted from that overall plan that was perhaps discussed before the game even started. And often the army commander also doubles up as one of those sub-commanders who is just as likely to not see the bigger picture as well. In short, if a sub-commander goes rogue, is there anything that an army commander can do about that? So this week I wanted to develop that theme a little bit and discuss some of the options available to the army commander. So short of a court-martial or a firing squad, how does the commander keep his subordinates on task? So first off, we probably ought to ask the question, should the commander in a war game take so much control of the players on his side? Several commentators in the comments last week made that same observation. It's a game and everyone should be allowed to play their own game. Also, maybe they really can see something that the commander just can't grasp. And again, as many people noted, there are plenty of historical examples where a commander of an army has found that once the battle has started, that they have to trust their subordinates for better or for worse. Maybe a lack of control is actually a realistic reflection of command. But what if you do want to exercise great control? What options are available to the wannabe one Napoleon or Caesar that won't end up without creating a new cohort of ex-friends? So one option to consider are regular command staff collaboration during the game. And by this I mean taking five minutes at, at fixed points in the game to step away from the table to re-evaluate the plan as a team, you know, to discuss the objectives and to hear each sub-commander's appraisal of the battle and how it's going. This gives the commander a chance to pull back and see that big picture and to make sure that everyone is reminded of the victory conditions and their part in achieving them. I've played plenty of games where the objectives have been laid out by the umpire before the game only for one or more players to immediately become blind to those objectives and I'm as guilty as the next game on doing this on occasion. Another option would be for the army commanders to exercise greater control of specific units such as corps or army assets like artillery or reserves. It's common in the games that I've played for these to be allocated to specific sub-commanders and therefore absorbed into their command. But what if the army commander retained direct control of these assets even after they've been assigned to a particular part of the battlefield? As I said in my introduction, it's common for army commanders to also double up as core commanders, removing them from the overall role they, they need to exercise to coordinate their strategy, giving them control of a range of army assets across the whole battlefield instead of just a core, gives the player an active role in the game but also helps retain that overview role. Now in this way it would help them to focus on all of the army, giving them an opportunity to coordinate more closely with their sub-commanders. Now the level of command and control will depend on the size of the game and of course on the period being played. You know, a final uh, option to consider would be to allow the commander to take control of part of a subordinate's command, such as a brigade, during the game. Now, I'm not sure how this would work in practice or if the owner of the command commandeered brigade would be very happy with this option. A variation on this would be to allow the army commander to form a reserve by drawing off units from his corps. Having decided on the overall strategy and the individual objectives of the sub-commanders, the army commander could then, would then have to decide on the resources allocated to each sub-commander to achieve the objectives that he set them. Any resources not allocated would then form a reserve under the direct control of the army commander to be deployed and reallocated as he or she sees fit as the battle evolves. This would certainly change the dynamic around the games table and could make for some very interesting conversations both before and after the game. Of course you may decide that all these options are unnecessary and I'm not suggesting that they be crowbarred into your existing games and rules. But if you think the army commander needs a different role to his subordinates then maybe some of these ideas are worth considering. 
As always, I would love to hear what you think on this particular subject. Am I proposing a recipe for disaster or an interesting way to make larger multiplayer games more engaging and realistic? Feel free to suggest alternative ideas or to explain why I'm meddling fool and my ideas would never work. So please leave your thoughts and comments and ideas in the comments section below. So time for a hobby update. Yesterday I put out my review video of the Wars of the Roses rule set test of resolve. As with so many projects this was something that I said I would do probably over a year ago but I've only now got round to. So over the last couple of weeks I've filmed two flip throughs of the rules. The first version was over 90 minutes long and had to be redone. Um, and I've been editing it together in the hope, what I hope is a, a simple explanation of the rule set. In the end it came out about 25 minutes long, so a bit longer than my usual output, but hopefully it's detailed enough so that you understand what makes these rules so fun without boring the pants off you. Now keeping in a Wars of the Roses theme, I have been relabeling my Wars of the Roses army. Yes, you heard me correctly. Despite labelling my collection just a few weeks ago and talking about it on this channel, I have now redone them all again. <laughs> so while, mate, while, while making the rules review video, I played a solo practice game here in the operations room. However, during the game, I realised I just wasn't entirely happy with the base labels that I'd done recently. Or the fact that the, the resolve dice and the holders they're in could easily get muddled up as companies squished together and melees grew, grew bigger and bigger and so on. So I decided I wanted to redo the labels uh, to not only make it easier to identify the units that they belong to, but also to keep the resolve dice under control. Um, you know, I pondered my options and I decided I wanted to merge the dice holders with the unit labels. Um, so I'll put some pictures um, up here so you can see what I mean. And I hasten to add, this is entirely unnecessary to the rules. I reckon I have a bit of OCD in me because when I get an idea like this, I just have to scratch that particular itch. I mean, that being said, I really am happy with how these look now and also a little annoyed with myself for not having come to this conclusion ages ago. So we've got time for a book review. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, the wife and I visited Chartwell, the home of Winston Churchill. Now, this is a National Trust property with beautiful gardens that overlook the centre of Kent. Now, the house is very interesting, includes many references to Churchill's years as a war leader. Now, I have to say, I'm not an unmitigated fanboy. Churchill had more than enough negative traits for two lifetimes. But I do also recognise that he had moments of genius, especially in those dark years of the Second World War. So this week's book review is all about that genius for thinking outside the box. So the book this week is Churchill's War Lab by Taylor Downing, and it looks at the circle of experts and scientists that Churchill brought into the inner circles of government during the war. The book starts, as most of these do, with a broad biography of Churchill's early years and those formative events that would shape the war leader of the future. Most of this is standard stuff, but it's written in a fast and energetic way that I think will appeal to even the, a well-read Churchill fan. Most importantly, it sets the scene for this most unlikely of leaders whose career went through many ups and downs before he claimed the premiership. Danning then goes on to look at the various groups of advisers that Churchill gathered together and relied upon during the six long years of World War II. These included, unusually for the time, key scientists and engineers uh, who found in the Prime Minister a willing audience, an eager audience, for their ideas. Churchill is often portrayed very much as somehow someone for whom new technology and new discoveries were endlessly fascinating, and that is shown very well in this book. Now, two facts in particular caught my attention. The first was the fact that the younger Churchill was rather bad at maths. He struggled with this discipline and indeed all academic subjects other than history and the classics, which means that he was far from being a, a scientific person himself. However, he was able to see the application and value of scientific discover discoveries um, that some of his contemporaries were just not able to do. The second interesting fact that leaps off the page to me was that Churchill liked to get his hands on new weapons, hence the cover picture shown above, uh, and was almost childlike in his enjoyment of new technology. Having said that, the author doesn't gloss over Winston's very conservative, with a small c, attitudes to Britain's place in the world. 
Now this section of the book looking at the power play that developed between Britain and America as the war progressed was for me the most interesting. Churchill and Roosevelt appeared to have developed a genuinely close friendship in which the British Prime Minister initially had the most influence. But as America joined the war and its commitment to defeating Hitler increased, so England's negotiating advantage as the brave underdog was slowly and irrevocably eroded. From what I've read, it's now a generally agreed fact that it was largely America that benefited from the fruits of British scientific engineering developments in that period, uh, developments so carefully fostered during Churchill's premiership. So the jet engine and early work on splitting the atom are the most notable examples, but there are many, many more. Similarly, control of many colonial investments passed to the US in one form or another by the end of the war. Britain was on the verge of bankruptcy and it was only through deals like the Lend-Lease programme that Britain was able to continue in the fight to the very end. Reading this book it is clear that although Churchill tried to mitigate the decline of the British Empire he also understood that if this was the price that had to be paid for victory then it was a price he was willing to pay. When he first became Prime Minister he was asked in the House of Commons what his policy towards Germany would be. And his answer was not, not only roused the fighting spirit of the nation, but it also foreshadowed the sacrifices to come. And he said, you ask, what is our aim? I can answer it in one word. It is victory, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard that road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed this book, even though I wasn't quite... It wasn't quite the book I thought it would be when I actually started reading it. It, it took a, it take, looks in great detail at the, the, the great and influential people that Churchill surrounded himself with. Scientists, mathematicians, engineers and military men. He pushed them all hard, sometimes too hard. But he also replied upon, re relied upon their advice and ideas, probably more than any other Prime Minister before him. Now, above all, this book is about leadership and the ability of one man to galvanise a whole nation to extraordinary effort. So that's it for this week, and as always, please join in the conversation in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and share. It really does help grow the channel and the conversation. And if you want to keep up to date with weekly content from this channel, please tap the bell notification icon. So until next week, stay safe, keep gaming, and of course, keep rolling high.